Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's a, a thrill to have a, a great audience uh, on probably the nicest day so far this year, you know, to come inside for a, an excellent speaker is, is outstanding. Um, uh, our speaker today is part of the AWSP, so the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors Distinguished Lecture Series. So once a year they pick uh, one person to go to a number of universities, and this year we were fortunate to host the AWSP Distinguished Lectureship. Um, our speaker today, Pedro Alvarez, uh, comes to us from Rice University, uh, where he's a distinguished professor, but also he heads the uh, Engineering Research Center there, uh, sponsored by NSF. So this is a very big multi-year grant, 20 million? 20 million? 20 million, give or take dollars, give or take. Um, and four universities involved, but Pedro is the, essentially he conceptualized it, he visualized it, brought it together, built the team, and got the grant after a couple tries. Uh, a really outstanding facility, globally known for the work that they do, uh, largely wrapped around uh, water treatment technologies, which he's going to present to us today. Um, I had the opportunity to know Pedro when we were both at the University of Iowa, and he's been a mentor to me the whole way along, and, and a fantastic person. He's truly one of the most giving, generous people in our field, um, helping do a lot of international work as well. And uh, in, in his normal, humble self, walking down the hall, he said, please don't say a lot about me. Just get right to the point. So I said, I need to say at least three things. So the three things he picked was that he's the winner of the Clark Prize. It is the top award in our country, essentially, for water-related research. So, and it's given one per year. So really outstanding, considering not just environmental engineering, but chemistry, other areas that go into water treatment technologies. And Pedro was selected as that. He also was just elected this spring to the National Academy of Engineering, which he hasn't even gone through the induction ceremony yet. So congratulations, Pedro, on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the other thing he said was that he was honored to be selected by peers to be the AWSP Distinguished Lecturer, and he's also a former president of AWSP. So with, with no further ado, uh, Dr. Pedro Alvarez to talk about his nanotechnology-enabled water treatment. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> well, thank you. It is uh, indeed a great pleasure for me to be here and have a chance to see old friends like Joel and Dan and Mark and... Uh, meet new people that are doing very exciting work here and, and thank you for arranging for such beautiful weather. Yes, I really appreciate that. Well, um, I think I am speaking to the choir when I tell you that the importance of clean water to global health and to economic development simply cannot be overstated. But unfortunately, providing clean water in an affordable and reliable fashion is getting harder because the demand for it is growing with an increasing population because water pollution is becoming more complex and more difficult to treat, and climate change with more frequent droughts and extreme events and sailing intrusion in coastal areas are exacerbating freshwater scarcity. What I want to do today is to present a vision of how nanotechnology can help us achieve water security and also address growing challenges at the water energy nexus, and along the way, I will be presenting some of the research that we're doing at NEWT, this uh, multi-university center that is headquartered at Rice University. And not all of this research is mine. Some of it is uh, a team effort. Uh, some of it I'm not even part of the team. So I will try to give due credit when, when the need uh, comes up. As I was saying, maybe a good place to begin is remind you that although we live in a water abundant planet with about 70% of its surface covered by water, only a very little bit of it is actually available for our anthropogenic needs. This sphere right here is an accurate representation of the total water that there is in the world. And if we remove first the oceans and then the glacier ice, we're left with a very small amount, 0.014% of the total, in available in a readily renewable fashion like lakes and rivers. And that water represents severe competition for different uses by different users, which reminds me of what a distinguished citizen of this state used to say, that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. <laughs> and uh, um, to illustrate this issue, let's consider first the uh, oil and gas industry. You know, water is a trillion dollar a year challenge to, for this industry. First of all, when you extract oil, a lot of formation water comes out. In fact, some of these oil and gas companies are really water companies that produce oil and gas as a byproduct, some people say. And these waters, produced waters, represents a major disposal challenge because they have 
very high salt concentration, sometimes seven times saltier than seawater. You have radionuclides even, uh, heavy metals, toxic hydrocarbon, biocides, and so on. Also, it takes a lot of water to get oil out. Sometimes you need to uh, inject steam. Sometimes you need to inject water to maintain the hydrostatic pressure. In Texas, for example, to get a barrel of oil, you need 10 barrels of water. And this is often in uh, semi-arid areas. So, so this underscores a need for uh, treating locally and reusing locally those produced waters. And of course, um, these produced waters also represent a missed opportunity for beneficial disposition, not only to enhance oil recovery, but also to enhance, for example, desert regreening. On in some cases, like California, where the water is not so salty, you can use it for agriculture. It's also important to remember that uh, producing electricity requires also a lot of water. You know, to have a light bulb on for one day is the equivalent of having a 100 liters of water. That's the virtual water equivalent. Yes, it is non-consumptive, but nonetheless, it represents significant withdrawals. On the other side of the coin, it takes a lot of energy to treat and distribute water. A typical city will spend 20% of its electricity moving water and distributing it. And some treatment processes of growing importance, like desalination by reverse osmosis, are very energy intensive. 55% of the cost of uh, reverse osmosis desalination is energy. Uh, so this underscores the need for technological innovation to develop some low energy approaches. But perhaps most important to remember is that water is still a major limiting factor to human capacity. And that we can save more lives than doctors by treating water, as illustrated by this graph that reminds us uh, of the benefits of disinfection and enhanced sanitation. This is the life expectancy of Americans at birth in the year 1900, and today we're at 78%, primarily due to our work. Uh, of course, uh, this is what I call working on the correct side of the decimal point. But uh, uh, we have not won this, this war. Right now, one half of all hospital beds in some parts of the world are occupied by someone who got sick by a waterborne infectious disease. Now, we already spoke about the importance of water to energy, but also for food production. To produce one kilogram of beef, you need about uh, 15,000 liters of water. And of course, water is also very important for um, economic development and, and job creation because both drinking water and industrial wastewater treatment and reuse are rapidly growing global markets with great need for technological innovation, especially for developing distributed treatment systems. And uh, I guess what I am doing here is advocating for the need for modular treatment processes that would be small and easy to deploy and that would have superior treatment capacity to tap unconventional water sources like uh, wastewater, ocean water, briny groundwater, storm water. And the idea is to enhance water security as we advocated in this recent uh, es and feature article that we just published, uh, you know, maybe a couple of months ago. And there are many drivers that support this vision. Uh, one is that sometimes you just have no choice. We got 43 million Americans that are not connected to municipal central distributed systems or people that don't have electricity like in Puerto Rico right now. Uh, of course, uh, this matching the user location to, to, to water supplies that are unconventional reduces uh, the need to distribute water through old and leaky uh, distribution systems that often contaminate the water. And you have a lot of losses that result in energy losses. Uh, so, you know, California re recently had a drought and they had to conserve water. And that ended up saving for them more energy than any incentive and policy that they had adopted to save energy. That's why the DOE is coming out with a clean water hub initiative uh, hopefully soon. But also, decentralized treatment systems give you greater flexibility so that you can match the treated water quality to the intended use. I'm talking about fit for purpose treatment so that you avoid wasting treatment capacity to lower costs. And this represents also a great opportunity for advanced materials, for material science, for nanotechnology, for chemists, to develop materials that exhibit higher selectivity for those pollutants of highest priority. So that, again, you can um, avoid wasting treatment capacity on 
inconsequential constituents in water. So I guess I mentioned the word nanotechnology. This is a smart audience. I don't think I need to define it. I pasted here the definition from the National Nanotechnology Initiative. What is important here is that this is about working at a very small scale at the atomic and molecular level to create novel structures that exhibit very different, sometimes extraordinary size dependent properties that enable different functions. For example, you take gold. We use it in jewelry because it is inert and it doesn't corrode easily. But at this scale, gold can become a hypercatalyst. And carbon, which is a good insulator, at the nanoscale, it can become a superconductor. So nanotechnology is already revolutionizing many industries like electronics, drug delivery, and, and in a similar way, it can bring about some beneficial disruptive innovation to the water field. Our vision as a center is to enable access to clean water pretty much anywhere in the world by developing this next generation of modular treatment processes that are, again, small and easy to deploy and that can treat and tap unconventional water sources both to protect human lives and to support economic development. And initially, we're focusing on two opportune niches. One is drinking water for people that are off the grill or for emergency response, including, again, those 43 million Americans. But also we care about industrial wastewater treatment in remote locations. And since we are from Houston, connecting to the oil and gas industry made a lot of sense. And uh, here the idea is to minimize the need for fresh water withdrawals and minimize the impact upon discharge. That's why we are reusing, treating and reusing those waters locally. And we are using nanotechnology. And you may ask why. There is a lot of ideas out there. A lot of technology is being proposed. Why nano? Well, if I were to say, pick two words, one is multifunctionality. See, wastewaters have a complex mixtures of different pollutants that require different functions or different processes to be removed. Some pollutants are more easily removed by absorption or precipitation. Others need to be oxidized. Others need to be reductively dechlorinated and so on. If you could combine these functions in the same material or reactor, you could simplify these large and clunky treatment trains and miniaturized treatment systems so they are smaller and easier to deploy. The second reason besides multifunctionality is higher selectivity. Again, so that you can focus your treatment capacity on the highest priority pollutants and avoid wasting treatment capacity on things that don't matter. But also, on a per atom basis, these materials are much more reactive than their bulk materials. So they give you an opportunity to develop superior catalysts, absorbents, multifunctional membranes that have self-cleaning and self-repairing properties, and so on. And as I'm going to show you soon, unprecedented capabilities to harvest sunlight to directly treat wastewater or, or drinking water. Before I give you examples, uh, the last vision slide, I want to explain uh, basically how the center is organized. So our vision, again, is uh, treat to fit, fit for purpose treatment. And you have many different types of source waters, and your treatment objectives can vary also. So you need a lot of flexibility here. And that's why we choose modular processes that you can plug and play as needed. And the first thing we want to do, typically, is to remove compounds that interfere with other processes that, for example, cause scaling of membranes or absorbents. And uh, usually for um, the oil and gas industry, maybe that's all you need to do, remove things that interfere with their friction reducers or their gelling agents. And, uh, and, and that's okay, but if you want to drink the water, then you need to, of course, remove a lot of uh, toxicants and priority pollutants. And it's here where we favor catalytic and physical processes over those traditional processes where you are, for example, chemicals to promote coagulation, because we want to uh, minimize waste streams. And sometimes you simply need to desalinate. Sometimes uh, you, you live in a coastal area or you, your only access has a lot of salt. And here, we favor low energy desalination. And I'm going to begin with an example of this. What I'm showing you here is something called membrane distillation, where the general idea is that you heat up water to generate a vapor. And the vapor traspasses a hydrophobic membrane, which does not allow the passage of water, but vapor can get through. 
and the vapor condenses on the other side, and then you get distilled water. And of course, this is not low energy. This is, in fact, one of the problems with this is that it requires a lot of energy to heat up water. But we do it because it has a big advantage over reverse osmosis, which is that there is no limit on the salt concentration that you can treat. See, with reverse osmosis, you can barely get to sea water type. But we're dealing here with produced waters that have seven times the salinity uh, of, of seawater, and reverse osmosis is has no, not a prayer. So that's one major problem, cost, because of high energy consumption. The other big problem is, is inefficiency caused by the, the fact that, uh, here is your membrane, right? The uh, temperature of the water cools down as, at the interface with the membrane. That decreases the temperature gradient and, and decreases the flux. This is something called temperature polarization. And you can lose 70% of the flux due to this phenomenon. So how can nanotechnology help us address these two challenges? Now, one, make it cheaper, and two, make it more efficient. The answer lies in nanophotonics. Naomi Hallas, who is a world leader in this field, a professor at Rice University, found that there are some particles that when they are irradiated, even by sunlight, their outer shell of electrons begins to vibrate in concert, creating a surface plasmon effect. And, and essentially, that ends up being a highly localized phototermal effect that can boil water. She can even boil ice with these particles. But of course, her original particles were expensive. They were made of uh, gold. So Chiling Li uh, actually uh, had a really good idea. She, she said, well, let's use cheaper nanoparticles, in this case, carbon black, that have, again, localized phototermal uh, properties. They do not have, by the way, I should have mentioned this, um, the Omis particles have a photon conversion efficiency of 80%. The best solar cell in the world right now, at best, can get you 17% photon conversion efficiency. So this is a major breakthrough. But Shilin's idea was to make membranes in a plate and frame uh, configuration that looks like a, like a solar panel and coat the upstream phase of the membrane with these particles so that when they are irradiated by sunlight, uh, you would actually reverse temperature polarization. You would increase the temperature gradient and therefore the flux. And in a first generation of membranes made of uh, electrospan fibers coated with this carbon black, using an artificial temperature gradient of only 15 degrees Celsius. She was able to increase the flux by 30%. When she took those membranes outside and exposed them to the Houston sun, which is, you know, like today here, she was able to get, uh, you know, about 60 times more water, distilled water produced in only 20 minutes when the membrane was coated. So it's very encouraging. Peter Norlander has been doing some Monte Carlo modeling, and he's finding that uh, we can even improve on this significantly by uh, choosing uh, carefully the interparticle distance and the thickness of the cover layer, and by using micro lenses to focus the fine light better. But what is important here is that we already have decreased the cost of desalination by one half in these small units. Uh, because remember, one half of the cost was uh, electrical energy, and, and this is, we're using a free source, which is sunlight. And this is what the membrane looks like. This was done by our student. This is a small unit, a uh, test unit, that um, you can put in your backpack and, you know, produce enough water for four people if you got sun shining on it for eight days. So, of course, we can do a lot better. And, and here we see the head of NSF, Franz Cordova, with Joe Colberson, which is a congressperson. Uh, that it looks like they're drinking tequila, but actually this is distilled water. I want to <laughs> clarify that. Now, along the lines of um, low energy desalination, we have uh, something called capacity deionization that has been around for a while, at least 10 years. And the general idea is to use electrodes that are charged to separate cations like sodium from anions like chloride. And, and it works okay, but it has a problem. This uh, absorption capacity gets very easily saturated. And you can only treat briny water of up to 8,000 milligrams per liter of TDS. You can certainly not treat seawater with this. So how can nanotechnology help? Well, one logical answer is nanomaterials are primarily all surface. By providing a large surface area, you can enhance the absorption capacity. And I'm illustrating here 
electrodes that have a, a, a car vertically aligned carbon nanotubes, but you can use better, probably cheaper, uh, to use some um, graphene oxide nanocomposites that also have high conductivity. Um, now, you can control the pore size distribution so as to minimize the diffusion distance and enhance absorption kinetics, which is also favorable. But more importantly is this. The oil and gas industry doesn't care about you removing common salt, sodium chloride, which is by far the most abundant ions that are present in this water. And that's because their friction reducers and gelling agents work well, work well with salt. What they want to remove are multivalent cations like calcium, barium, and strontium that cause scaling. So to make this selective for the removal of these compounds, we're trying to use these uh, ion exchange polymer coatings, very thin coatings, that exhibit high perm selectivity for the uh, target compounds. And, uh, you know, on a first trial, we were using uh, a cross-linked polymer of PVA with glutaraldehyde. It's a thin layer coating uh, activated carbon electrodes here that are relatively cheap, just 5 to 10 micrometers thickness. And already we're seeing a preferential removal of calcium to sodium of about 10 to 1. So that way you don't waste your absorption capacity on sodium and you focus it more on these multivalent cations. So this is very early work. Most of what I'm showing you is relatively early and, and uh, it looks promising, but uh, of course it's not demonstrated fully. I'm personally interested in um, photocatalysis. The general idea is that you irradiate a material uh, to form reactive oxygen species that can either oxidize pollutants or kill germs. And in this example, because I come from rice, I gotta tell you a little bit about fullerenes. This is the C60, right? Um, uh, this is a compound that uh, got uh, Rick Smalley and Bob Corll the Nobel Prize in 2005 in chemistry. Uh, essentially, if irradiated by sunlight, uh, the compound or molecule is excited to a triplet state. And then that triplet state energy gets transferred to molecular oxygen. It actually causes a change in the spin of one of the electrons, generating singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is a reactive oxygen species. It's not as strong as an oxidant as the hydroxyl radical that titanium dioxide and um, other, uh, um, you know, photocatalyst, uh, semiconductor type photocatalyst produce, but nonetheless is good enough to kill bacteria. The point I want to make is that just like other advanced oxidation processes, photocatalysis suffers from inefficiency because first, the ROS are very short-lived. These things only last, uh, I don't know, a few microseconds. And then they get scavenged by things that you don't care about, like carbonates or natural organic matter. So how can we make this more efficient and more selective? Well, we advocate something that we call the bait hook and destroy approach where you attract the target near sites of photocatalytic ROS generation so that the, 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 uh, the oxidizing species can be used more efficient. In this case, using the bingo reaction, we attach this uh, chain with an amino group that is positively charged because bacteria and virus are negatively charged. So we're using electrostatic attraction as our hook to destroy and, and kill these germs. And here we're comparing the performance of that amino fullerene to titanium dioxide, which is P25, the gold standard of autocatalyst. This is making a much stronger oxidant. But here, as you can see in this example, selectivity trumps power. This more selective, um, you know, uh, photocatalyst that attracts the target is more effective in disinfecting. Uh, and, and of course, it has the advantage that it can be used with sunlight in places where, uh, you know, you have no electricity, which is usually where you need disinfection the most. Of course, there's two things that should be coming through your mind right now, which is one is, uh, can someone in a rural area in a developing country afford nanotechnology? And two, these are particles. What if they end up in the treated water and you drink it? Is that a concern, right? Well, the answer to both of those concerns lies in immobilization. You see, first of all, it doesn't matter how much a certain amount of catalyst costs. What matters is how much it costs you to treat a million gallons of water. And if you can reuse that amount over and over to amortize its cost, you can very quickly get into the feasible region. The second thing is, these are not toxic, but even if these materials were toxic, if there is no exposure 
there is no risk. So by immobilizing the materials, not only you enable reuse to lower its cost, but also you prevent exposure and therefore you eliminate the risk. That's the idea. So we were able to immobilize them using covalent bonds. Uh, in this case, we are uh, immobilizing them into like silica grains to mimic a model for sand. We were able to reuse them over and over efficiently without loss of effectivity. And a nice surprise was that not only was this an effective disinfectant, but it was also destroying relatively recalcitrant pharmaceuticals and endocrine disruptors that right now are breaking through our wastewater treatment systems. So right here, this suggests one way how you, we can start using nanotechnology without having to change system architecture too much. Most wastewater treatment plants in the US and Europe have UV disinfection. They have a UV chamber for disinfecting. You don't want to use chlorine because that generates uh, disinfection by products that are nasty. So you can very easily retrofit this UV chamber and make it a fluidized bed reactor with this uh, floating beads that are easier to retain for reuse that are essentially coated with nanoparticles. And this is an example. This is a fluidized bed that we use in a project that we had in Swaziland. Swaziland is, by the way, the uh, last mon absolute monarchy on Earth. It's an interesting place in landlocked in, in South Africa. And in this case, uh, we were working with FAO, the, the United Nations Food and Agriculture uh, Organization. And uh, we came up, first of all, we did not use fullerenes. Here we use titanium dioxide, food grade titanium dioxide, because it's really cheap. We're talking about a dollar a pound, cheaper than activated carbon. And again, it's food grade, so, so that it should be easier to accept by the public. And we calcinated it onto sand particles. And uh, this is a five gallon reactor meaning that you can take it with you on a plane. And with uh, you know, a contact time of 30 seconds, you were able to produce 10 gallons per minute, which is enough to provide uh, water for 15 households. So it worked really well. It's encouraging. Of course, this uh, bait and hook approach uh, that, that we talked about earlier, there are more sophisticated ways to immobilize titanium dioxide. In this example, we're using um, electrospan porous fibers that are weaved into a mat. And, and they're porous so that you can have better access of the uh, pollutant to the embedded TiO2. And the idea is to, again, attract the, the, this polymer. It's somewhat hydrophobic. It's fluorinated so that uh, it can resist oxidation by ROS. And it can attract moderately hydrophobic compound, absorb them close to photocatalytic site, and destroy them right there. So we're using, in this example, methylene blue because it's easy to visualize. And we're separating the two processes first debate. As you can see, the polymer absorbs methylene blue, and now this water is treated. And we do this under dark conditions. And then we turn on the light to destroy the methylene blue and regenerate this photocatalytic mat. And in some cases, you want to uncouple absorption and degradation. For example, if you have really murky wastewater and you just want to fish out the pollutants and degrade them under more favorable, higher transmittance conditions. But of course, for uh, secondary effluent polishing, as I was showing you later, to destroy endocrine disruptors, you don't need to separate them. You can do it simultaneously. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the ability of this photocatalytic mat versus a slurry reactor. This is the common way that we apply right now TiO2 uh, to the great bisphenol A. And, and what I want to point out is that in both cases, there is a significant loss in performance as you move from an ideal system with distilled water to real wastewater effluent where you have a lot of ROS scavengers. But that decrease in performance is much less for the photocatalytic mat because it's able to bait and hook the BPA close the photocatalytic side so that the ROS are more efficiently utilized. And this more efficient utilization results in significant energy savings. And this is what is more important here. Because the capital expenditure for photocatalysis are nothing compared to the operation expenses, and most of it is energy. So this red line is something called the electrical energy per order of reaction. It's essentially how much electricity do you need to operate these UV lamps so that you can remove the pollutant by one order of magnitude. And you can see that before this slurry, you know, the electricity requirements increased by 11-fold versus only two-fold for the uh, photocatalytic mat. Again, because you have a material that is more selective about removing the target pollutant, so you need less energy to, to, to take care of it. Anyways, um, I got two more examples that deal with biofouling. 
control or, or, or biofilm control. And, and this is important for two reasons. One, biofilms often hide and harbor dangerous pathogens in distribution systems and, and in storage systems. And the second one is that they also uh, are essentially encourage corrosion. And, and both of these are multi-billion dollar problems. And it's so difficult to eradicate biofilms because you add a biocide and it doesn't penetrate, it doesn't diffuse in. It only kills the outer layer of our bacteria, the inner bacteria are protected. So in the first example, we're gonna try to discourage biofilm formation in membranes, in water filtration membranes, as you all know, Biofouling of membrane is their Achilles heel. This is something that is very costly. It reduces their economic life. It increases energy requirements to push the water through. So, so in this uh, example, what we did is we work with silver nanoparticles. As you know, silver nanoparticles are the most commonly used nanoparticle in commercial products. There's over 300 products in the market that have silver nanoparticles. It was the original magic bullet that Ehrlich used to fight syphilis. And we know that, that it works, so um, we, in this particular case, we're making polymeric polysulfon membranes using the wet inversion process. Another silver nanoparticles at about 5% by weight. And I'm choosing this example because it's old. It's about maybe eight or 10 years old. Let me see when did I publish that. Yeah, 10 years old. But it was the first time that a nanomaterial was incorporated into a membrane. So that's why I chose this. And this was Catherine Sudro, who is now a professor at Montana Tech. He, she ended up getting her PhD with many Elimelech at Yale. Anyways, um, we proceeded to see if we had worked by filtering some live bacteria on top of the membrane. These were microfiltration membranes with relatively large pores. So we set the membrane on top of a nutrient agar and this allows food to get through the membrane and if the bacteria are alive, they begin to grow and they form colonies that you can see with your naked eye and you can count them. And the point is that the silver impregnated membrane was very successful at preventing bacterial growth. But more interestingly, we took membrane coupons and dipped them in bacterial suspension, leave it there for a while, take it out, wash them, stain them with DAPI, and wash them in the microscope. And as you can see here, there was hardly any attachment of bacteria to the silver impregnated membrane because for one thing, silver nanoparticles release silver ions, which are the critical effector of the antimicrobial activity of nanoparticles. I showed that, I don't have time to show you that, but that's in a nano letters paper. The point here is that this silver, kind of like bacteria sense it, and most likely it exerts negative chemotaxis, so they go away. This discourages attachment, which is important. <clears throat> a nice surprise was that these membranes have relatively large pores. So the phages that are a lot smaller can get through that, those pores, and as you can see here, they break through. But when the membrane is impregnated by silver nanoparticles and it releases silver ions into the pores, these pores have a potent antiviral activity as well, and no virus are breaking through, so that was a nice uh, surprise. So this is about preventing biofilm formation. The second example is what is the biofilm already filmed? How do you eradicate it, right? And here, we're gonna be using germ warfare. We're gonna be recruiting the natural foes of bacteria, which are bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are virus that exclusively infect bacteria. They cannot infect protozoa, they cannot infect humans, they cannot infect animals, right? There's about 10 to the 30 one of them for every place you go, every river, every lake, ocean, for every bacteria, there's about 10 of these phages. So they are by far the most abundant biological resource on this planet, and perhaps the most underutilized resource because they play an important role in horizontal gene transfer and evolution. But, you know, people are already using these for medical applications. If you have a burn victim infected with a flesh-eating bacteria and no antibiotic is gonna take care of that MRSA, people are beginning to, to use phages. They, you know, they did it in the Soviet Union, in Tbilisi, Georgia, since the beginning of the century, and now Western medicine finally woke up and is recruiting these techniques. The FDA has approved the use of phages for food security. Maybe you don't want salmonella in that chicken soup, and they allow you, in some cases, to use uh, for human use, because, again, they cannot 
uh, affect your health directly. But most of these phages that people use have very narrow host range. And biofilms have so many different bacteria. So we were fortunate to come up with a method to isolate polyvalent phages that have remarkable broad host range. And they do much better, but they have a hard time penetrating the biofilm also. So what we do is we conjugate these phages onto super paramagnetic nanoparticles that can be pushed in with a magnetic field, and you can control how far you push them in. Maybe you want them to go to the anaerobic part of the biofilm where that Clostridium difficile is hiding, or maybe you want to turn right or left. And, and the point is that we're creating uh, magnetic Trojan horses, okay? And there is one trick to this. The phages have to be pointing in the right direction. They have to be oriented so that the tail fibers are outward because it is the tail fibers that recognize and infect bacteria. So how do we do that? Well, I knew that the head of these uh, uh, phages have a lot of carboxylic groups. So by coating the nanoparticles with uh, chitosan, a natural occurring polymer that has a lot of amino groups, we were able to form amide bonds and uh, very easily uh, have them properly oriented. So you get a high concentration of phages oriented in the right direction. You can see them here. These are the, the, the little spheres, the, the large, uh, of course, rods here are the bacteria and they're killing them right there. Does it work? Well, I think so. This is um, an epifluorescent image of a biofilm. If I add the uh, particles along without the phages, uh, they, you can cause some physical disruption, but these particles are not toxic. It's just rust, essentially. So they're not going to be killing the bacteria, but you can push them in and pull them back out, and that disrupts the biofilm. These polyvalent phages do really well. I mean, if I use a normal phage, it won't do this well, because they actually not only they have a broad host range, they also pack some depolymerase enzymes on them that break down part of the biofilm. But when I uh, load them onto these nanoparticles and give them a little help penetrating with a weak magnetic field, they do much better. So this is very encouraging. And, and we've been using this approach, by the way, to try to fight superbug proliferation in wastewater treatment plants in, in, in activated sludge. And the results are very encouraging so far. In this case, without the magnetic particles. You don't need them in that case. Anyways, oh, by the way, these super paramagnetic nanoparticles are excellent absorbents. They are of particularly arsenic. We use them in Guanajuato. We had a project where uh, one of the wells had a lot of arsenic. It's a mining area like here. Uh, and uh, of course, they had sand filters that were doing a good job for removing suspended solids and bacteria, but not arsenic. And we coated the sand with 5% by weight, and, and, and it worked really well for a while. In that particular location, there was too much silica, which uh, interferes and, and, and is preferentially absorbed, but so we only got like 2,000 bed volumes, but uh, in, in other places you can get 10, 15,000 bed volumes. But the point is that these super paramagnetic nanoparticles can be decorated with different functionalities, catalysts, adsorbents, um, you know, biocides, and so on, to essentially create multifunctional nanoparticles that are amenable for low energy magnetic separation so that you can capture them and reuse them. And we are testing this for industrial wastewater applications, not for drinking water, because uh, we are committed to never using a free nanoparticle for drinking water just in case they escape. Anyways, I think I have painted a relatively rosy picture, a very optimistic picture of what these materials can do for us. But we know that history is full of many promising materials and policies that have created a lot of collateral damage to the environment. And these are two of my favorite examples. One is Paul Hellman Mueller. You know? He won the Nobel Prize in 1948 for fighting malaria. Great cause. The only problem is that he used DDT to do it, right? <laughs> you know what DDT did to birds and the environment. This is a more interesting and sad case. This is uh, Thomas Migley was a mechanical engineer who was an amateur chemist, worked for General Motors. First, he added lead to gasoline as an anti knock agent. And later, in working with uh, air conditioning for cars, he discovered Freon, a chlorofluorocarbon. Many historians believe that no single organism has ever done more harm to the atmosphere than Thomas Migley. But the point is that we really are at an inflection point in which we need to make sure that nanotechnology is steward to be a tool for sustainability rather than a liability. And this requires us to have a proactive approach to risk management. 
So in Newt, we recognize that risk has two domains that are important. One is the intrinsic hazard of the material. And the other, of course, is exposure. And what I mean by that is that even if something is very hazardous, if there is no exposure, there is no risk. But we work on both sides of this equation. So for the hazard, we want to prioritize materials that are earth abundant, generally regarded as safe and, 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 and non-toxic, for example, that nanomagnetite that we were using is a food colorant. It's used to make chocolate look darker, just like the titanium dioxide, uh, you know, is also a food colorant. So, no time. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and on the exposure side again, what we focus on here primarily is immobilization, but doing in a manner that that does not hinder the functionality of the material when you immobilize it. Maybe use the substrate to enhance selectivity as I show you with the polymer that was photocatalytic. Okay, so that's, those are the challenges that we're facing. Anyways, I want to give some time for questions and answers. So let me wrap up by saying that I hope I have convinced you that nanotechnology has a great potential for beneficial innovation in many niches in drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment and reuse. It can allow us to develop new materials and enabling technologies such as this that can be incorporated into modular treatment processes that have superior treatment capacity. And uh, I would say that uh, Steve Jobs used to say that people don't know what they want until you show it to them. And you know, about 10 years ago, he showed us smartphones. I honestly didn't know that we needed smartphones 10 years ago. Well, today, these um, advanced materials and technologies that we are aspiring to develop and deploy are going to be like the smartphones of the water industry in the sense that they're going to be able to give you superior service in remote areas without infrastructure, even without electricity. With that, I want to thank the students that generated the data that I presented to you today, mainly shown in uh, uh, basically yellow here. I want to thank the rest of the new team. This is part of it. Uh, not all of it. We got about 30 professors and uh, over 100 students. And of course, I want to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this work. And above all, I want to thank you for your attention. So. Uh, thank you, Pedro. And we certainly have time for questions. Uh, a plenty. Phil. It's a fascinating tool. And uh, as a chemist, uh, I resonated with a lot of your positive comments. Uh, we are eternally grateful that Majorly was not a chemist. But, <laughs> but um, I, I got the impression from the beginning of your talk that you know part of the drive for all of this was to decentralize water treatment. But and I know there are many many aspects, and so uh, can you tell us for a few minutes in the decentralization model how we're addressing quality control? Yes, that's a very good question. There are different ways. One of them is to have sensors that essentially trigger alarms. But the more common way is right now when we buy, for example, a Brita filter or something like that for personal use, there are instructions. This has been exhaustively tested under different extreme conditions. And you know that you can have a certain life, economic life for it, and you add a safety factor. And then you tell people, well, you know, you need to change this every six months. And perhaps that creates another industry, a small business, where they come every six months and service it and take it from you. But this does not, decentralization does not need to be at the point of use level. Uh, in a city, for example, it could be at a neighborhood level where you have a point of, uh, you know, you, you treat the water to a certain non-potable but safe use that you can use for uses such as, uh, I don't know, uh, water in your lawn or, or essentially cooling for industrial. And then... In these satellite plants, you can essentially treat it to the to domestic use at a higher level. You don't have to worry about water quality degradation in the old and aging distribution system. And you can tap like local storm water, for example, or other things. You, you bring a very good point about decentralization, which is um, how do you trust people that they're going to disinfect that water and, and make sure that you don't have an epidemic of cholera because somebody uh, didn't do their job. And that's why th th you need to have some oversight, in my opinion, and do it at the, uh, not at the individual level unless you live in a remote area. 
but part of it is, again, uh, guidelines that tell you, you know, uh, this is only good for whatever, one year, and then you need to replace it, as we do already for some devices, uh, as we do for water softeners, for example. So, I mean, basically, the risk can be managed that way. We know how to do it. That would be the model that you might use for the decentralized water purification. That, that, that is correct, yeah. I mean, in some cases, you can afford not to have it, but in many cases, there is no choice but to but to have a decentralized systems because you don't have access to decentralized ones. There's one here first and then you, sorry. I noticed uh, on that project that uh, actually involved a lot of universities uh, trying to get a localized, uh, local community to test the water quality. Uh, I think the Puyallo University is also part of it. Uh, I wonder, I'm, I'm more into the ele electrical and uh, computer engineering side, so for the cyber side or connecting to the Internet of Things, of how are the sensors uh, used to test water quality? Uh, how can they actually be uh, used connecting to the Internet? Yeah. Let me clarify, we're, we're not working with sensors. I would love to partner with someone who does. But there is a lot of people out there developing all kinds of sensors, uh, some very simple ones that based on uh, voltometry or, 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 you know, like uh, uh, current measurement, they can detect uh, ions to more sophisticated Raman spectroscopy that can identify pathogens uh, and, and so on. Some people are using DNA probes coupled with, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, quantum dots to, 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 to make sure that the bacteria that are dangerous become fluorescent, for example. There's a lot of work out there. Of course, sensors need to have high selectivity and sensitivity and be cheap. So I think that there is a long way. Uh, the, the, my initial um, way is that you can use indicators like conductivity, for example, of the water. You know that if the conductivity starts going up, that means something is breaking through, and that's a cheap sensor. So. <coughs> mm. Okay, great talk. So uh, I so like uh, the nanoparticle, they are small. They have a high specific surface area. So then uh, why is it uh, highly selective? What uh, makes the selectivity high? Yeah. I just think uh, this is something they No, can that's a very good, quality. excellent question. So <laughs> what is selective, hopefully, is the nanocomposite, not just the nanoparticle. For a nanocomposite that is porous and you control the pores, you can use size exclusion to prevent larger natural organic matter from getting in. In some cases, uh, I use in the first example, electrostatic uh, attraction, to, to, but that could attract other things, right? And by the way, you can also repel things that foul membranes if you choose the right uh, uh, charge, right? Also, you can use the electrostatic uh, forces not only to attract the target, but also to repel bad things. Um, the, the bottom line, what I think, the more so, yeah, I'm gonna answer your question. Yeah, I think the secret lies a lot in nanocrystal facet engineering. I think that uh, if you can control the facet, you might be able to control binding energies for selective pollutants. You, we need a little more fundamental understanding based on density function theory and uh, 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 what those binding energies and so on are going to be. But I think that there is a lot of, let me leave it at that, there is a lot of promising approaches for enhancing selectivity. It won't be 100% selective, but it will be better than what we have. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yes, please. Uh, when you talk about this uh, porous carbon material with the nanoparticles inside, so there is, when you use it in uh, like polluted water, there is physical sedimentation of material on those pores. So how does the long-term stability of the, because the pores got clogged and... Uh, yeah, so many of these things have not been tested for long periods of time. Uh, because we're using, again, relatively inexpensive materials that are not hazardous to dispose of, I imagine that not always it will be feasible to regenerate this capacity. And that in some cases, you will just dispose of it or find another disposition. But the idea is that in our treatment modules, we will identify what are those compounds that cause interference. And we have a pretreatment module to remove those. Uh, it could be as simple as a sand filter. I have a question. Yes. A number of years ago, I talked to uh, Professor Dick Lucy from Stanford. 
he's the center, he has another center for wastewater. Yes. So you are director for this center for drinking water. You said that uh, you promoting decentralized system for drinking water, and he said, well, his finding is decentralized wastewater treatment system is good. So did you talk on how to make decentralized wastewater into decentralized drinking water? Yeah, no, I, we, um, I know um, Dick, of course, I have great respect for him. Uh, he's one of our leaders in the field, and uh, he had the vision not only to, to uh, play with the right level of decentralization, but also integrate water with natural systems, which is a very good idea, you know, taking account of the assimilative capacity of ecosystems. So he uses ponds and, uh, as Joel does here, trees and, and, and vegetation and so on. So. Um, the main difference is that I, I think um, their center focuses a lot on, on municipal uh, and existing infrastructure, and that's, of course, a bigger market. That's about $900 billion a year. We focus on a smaller market, about $14 billion a year, which is the decentralized or point-of-use market. But uh, we do talk, uh, to give you an example, their deputy director is David Selak, and he's part of our scientific advisory board. So uh, we are uh, getting excellent advice from, from them. They are uh, more senior than we are in terms of center uh, existence. I have a question. You showed some work that was being done in Africa um, with that. Are you partnering with any uh, substantial NGOs or groups that would help as you get technologies that develop? Yes. One, try to integrate them and then see what the maybe the barriers are to get them integrated into especially developing world countries? Yes, yes. So, so ERCs are meant to create an innovation ecosystem where they bring partners that sort of populate your value chain, including people that are uh, deployment uh, partners. We, lo we, we partner with a company called Localized Water Solutions out of Austin, Texas, who does a wonderful job of treating water for refugees, for refugee camps. And they recently licensed our uh, technology for the membrane distillation, so they're going to be doing some tr trials. Chilling Lee is also working with one of our colleagues uh, at UFSCI, the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina in Florianópolis, Brazil, where I'm also, as you know, a, a, a young professor. And in there, uh, they're going to be doing some large-scale trials in the field. Um, through Engineers Without Borders, I hope also to see some of these technologies being tested, but. Uh, Part of the ERC um, intention is to prepare a workforce that is globally competitive, and that requires students to interact with international partners as well. So. I see a question on chat on your right screen there. Oh, this is a good question. Let me read it. It's from Juliana Montenegro. How can we select the best coding method material? You talked about Kaitosan. Why did you choose it? Yeah. So, you know, that depends on, of course, the objective. You need to consider not only uh, what is the functionality that you require. In this particular case in Kaitosan, I just wanted something cheap that could bind phages, you know, with the health first. And I knew from organic chemistry, the first thing I learned was amide bonds. You know, it's like, so I knew that you could uh, join a carboxylic group with an amide bond, and that's why we, we went that way. But there was also literature. I guess uh, you know, the best recommendation is to read widely and voraciously and critically. As Pasteur used to say, you know, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, in this case, my student is the one that uh, suggested that to me, not myself, but I, it made immediate sense to me to create a mite bonds. Uh, but in some cases, uh, I mean, it's a matter of considering what is the functionality and the cost, right? Um, and the second question is, uh, Jaime, muy bien, pero me confundí con ahora un poco. I think that that was meant for someone else. <laughs> but uh, so that's the only question I saw. Who's Jaime? <laughs> and if there's any other questions online, we certainly could uh, entertain them now. I think we had about 40 people online joining us from across the US. How many? Uh, yeah, almost 40 people, I believe. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Any questions from the audience here? We'll like main, figure out some ideas how we can manufacture these things faster. And well, actually, and I was going to ask you, yeah, when we have this uh, discussion, you mentioned about this uh, somebody called Dr. Perry 
Line love was a Virginia accent. And I searched the internet, couldn't find it. So I'm going to ask him more information <laughs> exactly what it is so I can find it from the internet. Sure. I'll send you a slide, yeah. It's a 1970s paper. His last name is Perry, and it's called Perry's Scale of uh, Essentially uh, Intellectual Development and Problem Solving Skills. All right. Yeah. Yes, Rosa? You also mentioned this. Can you speak a little louder, please, so that the audience can hear you? Green water? Well, I mean, uh, in water resources, people often refer to green water, blue water, and gray water, right? <laughs> and that relates often to whether you're using water in a renewable fashion, in a, if you're consuming it, or whether you're withdrawing it uh, from you know, a lake or a river, or whether you're using rainfall, for example, for agriculture, and the gray water refers to the water that you impact, the volume of water that you end up degrading as a result of your operation. And th this all refers to the, the water footprint, right? It can be, it have three colors, <laughs> basically. It can be green, blue, or gray. Um, but I think when I hear the word green water, I mean, that brings to me um, a flavor of sustainability, meaning that we need to essentially minimize energy, minimize waste streams, and, uh, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, consider also the, the social aspects, the trade-offs uh, with ecosystem health and so on. So it's probably a more complex question than, than I have time to address, but it's certainly worth thinking deeply about it. Any other questions? Well, first of all, let's thank Pedro for sharing his... Thank you. I appreciate it. Has worked with us, and it's great to see everything from you know the science innovation, you know at the atomic level, into how to integrate this to really Im impact people's lives globally. So thank you again for your time with us. Um, we are going to have a reception out in the atrium, so if you want to have some other you know much harder questions for Pedro, I think we let him off the hook a little bit. So feel free to chat him up in the atrium right afterwards. And thank you again for AWSP for helping to sponsor this and make it possible. And congratulations, Pedro, on almost wrapping up a successful. Uh, distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you.